Yes, Father. Isn't the, the Sham Synod, which deposed San Fotios, recognized at the Eighth Ecumenical Council by the Roman Catholic? <coughs> okay, well, it was not, actually. Not from the beginning. So, the Sham Synod of 869 was initially, <coughs> was soon condemned by the Pope. Um, so, by the time of the Eighth Ecumenical Synod, Pope John, um, they condemned it. It, it was false and it was wrong. It was only in subsequent centuries. We're talking about um, sub subsequent centuries in the West when the Pope is, has a struggle between the civil authorities. The canonists of the Pope looked at old synods and they came across a canon in this sham synod that said the civil powers have no right to interfere in the election of a patriarch. And they were so taken with this canon that they forgot history, forgot the decisions of, the, 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 um, of Rome itself, and declared that synod the Eighth Ecumenical Synod. Um, so th that's where that comes from. But it was actually only centuries later, and in a very dishonest Way. Uh, what caused St. Uh, Ignatius to decide to turn against St. Fortius uh, and try to depose him? Th that is a good question, and forgive me for skimming over that part, but St. Ignatius, you have to understand, St. Ignatius was the son of, a, of an emperor. He was castrated um, by Leo the Armenian, who did not want him to um, usurp the throne. And there was a deep, I think there was a certain resentment in, in, in St. Ignatius. And the resentment was evident even before St. Photios was elected. St. Ignatius had a resentment against Patriarch Methodius, St. Methodius the Confessor, who restored the Holy Icons. Um, because St. Methodius had a more reconciliatory attitude towards the iconoclastic heretics. There was so much tension in the church that he wanted to get this, this problem over with. Um, St. Ignatius' party, they, they, were, they thought that wasn't harsh enough. And there was this kind of rift. And this was... The, this was, there was a partisanship in the Church of Constantinople before St. Photios' time. Now, St. Photios stayed out of it. And that's why he was actually elected so unanimously. Because he didn't, he never functioned on, on principles of partisanship in the church. In fact, he struggled very um, strongly to eliminate those. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't so much anything personal. And as I said, initially, St. Ignatius um, supported the elevation of St. Photios. It's just about a, a couple of months after, a month after, he had a change of heart. And really what we can say is that he did not have the moral fiber to, well, withstand that resentment at that point. And that's why he started stirring up problems for, for St. Photios, which by that time w put him in an uncanonical rebellion against the bishop. Um, so you know how each saint has something that they help people with when you pray to them? Um, what are some things that St. Fotios tends to help people with? Well, <laughs> I'd say I'd try it out. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't mean that offhandedly. Uh, think about it. If he was so gifted during his life, I mean, honestly, from every single angle, he could help people intellectually. He helped St. Ignatius. He, he actually gave medical care to Patriarch Ignatius, um, and as well as encouragement, which he says can be of great help as well. A saint so gifted in life obviously has tremendous boldness um, b before God. And, and I, it's hard to see any situation it, in which he would not be of great assistance. 
he pretty much went through every kind of trial in his life as well. How, who, how could he not help others who are suffering those trials? Um, thank you, Father. I, I had a question. If you could talk a little bit about, you know, finding meaning in your life um, when, you know, it just feels that you're stuck in a rut. I guess St. Fortius was stuck in exile and in prison for many years, and yet he seemed to still find meaning. Uh, right now, you know, Bishop Maximus was talking about this crisis in meaning that a lot of people uh, feel like there's nothing they can do, that they're powerless. Um, and uh, so how, what, what lesson could you help us draw from the life of St. Fortius when we find ourselves in, in such a state? First of all, I would point out that we tend to, we tend to see saints as people who walk on clouds and they're not affected by things that happen to them. Um, St. Fortius suffered. His letters from exile sh show he's not, he not happy about it. He's not happy about um, the situation in the church. He's not happy for his, the sake of his persecutors, right? But ultimately, ultimately, you have to draw on faith, right? Faith and faith in the church. That's, that's what he was alone, right? But um, I, it's, it's kind of, f forgive me, it's a bit, um, it's, forgive me, for, it's a bit hard to pinpoint exactly um, we're, we're exactly what it is, but um, for, first and foremost, his, his faith. But I would also add his faith in the church, Right? And this is an important point. Concerning what he suffered, I, I think a lot of us would be tempted to say, well, forget it. To, to, to not, not to see the divine, uh, divine part of the church. Seeing so much, um, uh, so much fault, so much sinfulness, in members of the church who are supposed to be your brothers um, could lead to scandal. It really could. And I think that nowadays we are very quick to be scandalized by um, things in the church, what we see, perceive as faults in people. Now, now let's put ourselves in the position of St. Photios. From what I can tell, it doesn't, it doesn't phase him. His faith in the church his faith in God is not shaken by that. And I think that would be the inspiration to, to, to draw for us. We are too quick to throw in the towel when it comes to the, to the church, um, especially when we see faults and divisions and schisms. And yet, wouldn't the logical thing be to do the best we can? And you see how much just one person can do for the church how much unity he, he can do. I just wanted to ask one question. I forgot if you actually answered this in your lecture, but you said shortly before St. Fotios' repose, he was sent into exile a second time, correct? Yes. What yes. was he sent into exile for? Yes, you're observant, Simeon. <laughs> Thank you. It, you, you know, his, we don't really know. It's very odd because he's sent in to exile by Emperor Leo the Wise. And it's all the more odd because St. Photios made St. Leo, uh, I mean, he's not Saint, Emperor Leo, he made him wise <laughs> by his instruction. He was his teacher. Why um, pay, pay, uh, Emperor Leo, uh, what he had against St. Photios is actually, is actually a bit of a mystery. Does the church have a specific, have specific instructions on, um, I know that sounds weird, but how to determine if it's worth leaving, um, you know, if something is worth schism, and when is that appropriate? Or is it 
totally uh, um, pastoral discernment. And when, as a lay person, how do you determine if it's worth it or not? For the simple um, method of action is this. The only thing that r grants you the r right, as it were, or actually not grants you the right, but is actually, uh, the Father say it's actually a responsibility, is if a bishop is in heresy. And in other circumstances, um, the bishops need to be obeyed, right? Um, overlooking their personal faults. Now, how that plays out, it takes a lot of, now, you can't just take that as some kind of legalistic document, as, as it were, and apply it to situations. It takes a lot of uh, enlightenment, counsel, prayer, because there are a lot of forces acting. On the one hand, especially in our age, we have a force, we have a penchant for rebellion. And we have almost, <laughs> it's too easy for us in many ways. On the, one, on the other hand, you have to balance it because the, at, at another point you have to st actually stand up. And not standing up, saying I don't want to be rebellious, can be actually a violation of, of your conscience. So it's a, it's a multifi multifaceted um, <laughs> question that requires, um, well, just that a lot of prayer, counsel, insight, illumination. The new calendars are very strong also on the issue of obedience to authority, right? And, and yet they d dismiss or forget precisely this canon of the first, second uh, synod where it says that if, a, well, meaning if, if a bishop preaches heresy openly, um, then you are to separate from him. It, it is not a suggestion, it is a responsibility. And not doing so is a violation of conscience. We have a responsibility as, as Christians certainly to confess our faith, always. Um, even to shed our blood in that process of, uh, of, of confessing on the one hand. On the other hand, the fathers also say that very few are called to be teachers. And, and we should be careful as a, in, in, the, in, the, as a, in a leap to a judgment that something is heretical. We need, we need guidance very often. If it's been identified by a previous council, by an inspired authority, the ecumenical synods, fine, if somebody tried to revive Arianism, Historianism, iconoclasm, and so on, all you have to do is basically point to the, the saints, you know, St. Athanasio, St. Kirill, and so on, St. John of Damascus, and whatever, and their writings to, to refute them, uh, so that you don't put yourself in the presumptuous position of saying, I'm a teacher, and I'm going to tell you what's right and what's wrong. So we're balancing two principles, the humility to uh, to recognize the truth of the church, to, to dedicate ourselves to it, to be willing even to shed our blood for it, on the one hand. On the other hand, not to think that we are know-it-alls. In Father's talk at the, the very beginning, he pointed out that, that theology is the queen of the sciences. It is greater than any other pursuit. It is not just memorization like medical school or whatever. They're complex principles. And 2,000 years of history, let alone the, all of the writings and the examples and the counsel and the, uh, of, the, of the saints who walked their path through this world and left us their legacy as an inspiration. To understand all of that, God grant us even just a drop of wisdom as we prayed this evening um, in, in, the, in the services from uh, from St. Uh, Photios, that, that we might even begin to understand the, the depths of those things, let alone to advance in them. And we should not be so presumptuous, as it were, in judging another person again, that we know it all. So we need, we need help. We need assistance. Uh, 
teachings of the Holy Fathers, good examples in our times. Our collective effort is effectively a prayer to God that he will raise up such examples or teachers or confessors that we need to be able to follow them. No easy, no easy matter. The, the ecumenical, there is no formula for the summoning of an ecumenical synod, which is a very complex, it's not just a simple matter of you get an emperor, you get so many bishops, and, and that's it. We have false councils which had all of those criteria, met all of those criteria, and yet were ultimately rejected by the church. So I, back to practicality, <laughs> you, 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 you need to, you as a layman, if you had that tempting thought, you know, such, so and so is, you know, is preaching some heresy or something, you should go first to your spiritual father. You should certainly be prayerful yourself. If it's somebody you know, you would, you would certainly, in, in humility and in, in an atmosphere of respect, assuming that it's a teacher, you know, um, a, a priest, a hierarch, a professor, um, uh, a catechist, something like that, or an elder, somebody older than you, you approach them with respect and say, can you clarify this for me? And my, I have this thought that that might be wrong for the following reasons, and is that the case or no? And then you, you listen to their answer, and then, and then you, as it were, as slowly escalate the issue if your conscience continues to trouble you. But I, we've talked much among ourselves about this problem, which is a, actually a, is, a, is a, an important, is a very important one, because we are now, as we are separated from world orthodoxy. And we have to, one of our primary responsibilities is that we make a good apology we don't just say, oh yeah, we've already answered that question, we're just going our own way. No, we have to know, we have to know, our faith will have to know, and we have an obligation to our, our brethren from whom we are separated, world orthodox, to make it clear to them why we have done this. Because the truth is salutary, it is the truth that saves us. And if we're right, they're deprived of something. If they're right, we are deprived of something. So we have to continue our struggle in this way, in a, in, a, in a virtuous manner. But we have to guard the principles that make the truth accessible to us. So humility, virtuous living. We have to have very high regard for that truth and, and labor together with our brothers with whom we are united to advance, as Father said, drop by drop, a little bit at a time, do everything we can to do our best to deepen our understanding and support those that God gives us to help the church. Well, um, as, as I say, it's a, it's a subject that, um, uh, uh, pardon me, I'm going to touch, going off on, I'm getting off on a big tangent, but I'm going to one, add one more little thought to this. Ironically, Perhaps we struggle with the issue of being tempted to be satisfied with a little bit of knowledge more than the innovators. To think, well, you know, we've already condemned ecumenism, the new calendar, surgeonism, whatever else that we're separated from, and that's enough. All we have to do is go to church, we've got the truth, and we succumb to the temptation to be a little bit smug. And yet our complaint against them is that they're ignorant and that they've done things wrong. They've embraced modernism or thrown out the church fathers or other things. Again, through some kind of ignorance and, and fascination with modern times and whatever, and that they need to know more. So we who are trying to preserve tradition have even more of a responsibility to be educated, to grow in our faith, to grow in virtue, to, to, to be able to give a good apology for every element of the faith than the modernists who are drifting away. That makes sense. I, I, it's, it's a little bit ironic. 
uh, but we have a, I guess what I'm saying is we have a heavy, heavy responsibility on our shoulders for the fact that we've taken this staunch position and said that we are going to confess our faith and be careful about it, and even in some ways rigid about it, but I'm using that word in a good sense. Um, that puts a big obligation on ourselves to be able to give a good apology for our, our resistance, our walling off, that's what the term that the canon said, to separate ourselves from those in the church, the new calendrists, the the so-called world orthodoxy who have succumbed to humanism, modernism, <clears throat> relativism, surgeonism, compromises in many different ways. That's why God gave us this seminary. That's why Metropolitan Kiprion, Metropolitan Chrysostomos, our synod now have blessed for this and, and why we try to contribute our part to help it grow and to serve the church and help it in its need for apologists, educators, uh, hierarchs, clergy who can continue to educate the faithful and help us to make a, to offer a good answer, a good apology for our position and save ourselves and God willing to help others to return from error as our patron did. <laughs>